Hey guys, how are we doing today? Welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, hi! My name is Caitlin Elliott, and I cover true crime cases that I post on Tuesdays and Fridays. And I've got two series called True Crime Tuesdays that I post on Tuesdays, and Crimes Through the Times that I post on Fridays. My more vintage cases are the Crimes Through the Times series. So, in my last video, we talked about the Velisca Axe murders, which is so controversial of what all happened and how the crime scene ended up getting contaminated and how it's still unsolved to this day. So, today I'm going to be talking about a solved case of um, something that actually really upset me when I remember hearing about it a long time ago, and this is the solved murder of Polly Class. This case begins in October of 1993, almost 30 years ago in a small town in California. So this case actually occurred on August, October 1st, sorry, October 1st of 1993, where three junior high students were having a sleepover, which if you don't know what junior high is, it's basically, I think, uh, middle school, so like grades six to eight. And I know there's some like junior, senior high school where in small towns they have like a combined school where 7th through 12th grades would go. So this is basically what they were doing. They were having a slumber party. So they were, the girls were all like super excited about this party. It was getting close to Halloween and they were all trying on all these different costumes at the party. Prior to the sleepover starting, Polly Class and Jillian Pellman were actually waiting at Polly's home. They were waiting outside of it because there was another friend that was supposed to arrive at the sleepover. And around 8.30 p.m. that night, the friend actually did arrive. And this friend's name was Kate McLean, and she showed up for the sleepover. And so now everyone has arrived to the sleepover, and the party was getting started. This particular night was just said to have been like any other sleepover on a Friday night. They had popcorn, they were watching movies, they were eating ice cream, had pillow fights, were just squealing, have a good time. The girls even planned to have an all-nighter, which is basically when you stay up all night and party and you don't sleep. So they were just like super excited about all this. I remember being so young and having sleepovers, and, you know, it was just the most exciting thing anyone at, um, around my age and around that age actually had. So they were just thrilled. The sleepover originally began in Polly's bedroom, but the girls ended up being too loud. And the um, around 9.45 p.m., Polly's mother, her name was Eve, and she opened up their door, uh, Polly's bedroom door and asked the girls to please quiet down. And they were being too loud. So on this particular night, Eve was feeling pretty good crappy she was sick with a very severe migraine and the noise that the girls were making just made it worse and her head was beginning to throb and she was feeling nauseous Eve then exited the room of the sleepover and she went to go take more medication for her headache before returning back to bed her bedroom was said to have been just across the hall from where the girls were actually having their sleepover and like I said Eve she took her medication she said goodnight to the girls and went back to bed just one hour later, something actually happened that would change the entire lives of everybody in that household. Around 10.30 p.m. that night, an intruder, who was unknown at the time, actually broke into the class family home and entered the room where the girls had been staying in. At first, Kate and Joanne, the two girls that had arrived for the sleepover, they thought it was just some type of prank that Polly was pulling on them to scare everybody. And soon everyone realized that this was not a prank and it was in fact a very real and scary scenario. The abductor showed them a knife that he had actually brought with him and he threatens the 12 year old girls with the knife telling them if he sc they screamed he would kill them. This unknown ma man begins to tie them up and right away he starts asking all kinds of questions including who lived in the house and um, who lived in the house and who's... Uh, girl, like how much money was at the house and who was all involved at the sleepover, what everyone's names were. And this is when Polly spoke up and she said this was her house and it was her sleepover. At this point, the girls were very understandably just terrified out of their minds. They had no idea what was going on. And this man informs the girls that he's not going to hurt him and he was only there for cash. He just was trying to rob 
rob them. So Polly informs the intruder that there was in fact a fair amount of cash money in her jewelry box on her dresser, but the man did not make any amount of effort or even attempt to go and take that money. The man, he started to gag the girls with duct tape over their mouths to prevent them from calling for help. He then places a few pillowcases over their heads and then said that at, it was still, it was said at this time that Eve, Polly's mother, was still asleep. So she heard nothing and she knew nothing about this was going on. The man then tells Polly that he need that she needed to go with him and the other two girls were supposed to count to a thousand. By the time they had reached a thousand, Polly was supposed to be back with this man and he would have left. So the girls were absolutely terrified and felt like they had no other choice but to comply. So they started counting to a thousand. And while they were counting the man, he did take Polly and led her out of the house. After a while, the girls, Kate and Joanne, they managed to ultimately free themselves from their um, bindings and remove the duct tape before they ran into Polly's mother's bedroom to inform her of what was happening. They were very, very frantic and they just kept shaking her and trying to get her awake. So Polly's mother, she was furious and she began to scold the young girls for waking her up knowing that she was not feeling good, knowing that she had a headache and... Once she realized what was actually going on, the girls explained that Polly was kidnapped. Eve really started to just panic and she ended up calling the Petaluma County Police Department and they quickly arrived onto the scene. The investigators entered the bedroom of Polly class and they began to search for any type of clues that they could that could lead to where her whereabouts was, were or um, what exactly had happened. So when they entered the bedroom, they realized that this was... The, this room in particular was just a complete mess. It looked like a bomb had gone off. There was just clothes thrown everywhere. It just seemed like the girls were in the middle of doing something. And it had been halted just abruptly. And on the floor of Polly's bedroom were pieces of cloth that had been used to tie up the girls. Along with cords from Polly's Nintendo game that had been cut with scissors. And the sheets that were over top of the girls' heads at the time. Remember they uh, put the hoods over them? They were tossed around on the floor as well. Unfortunately, the amount of evidence that would be found at the scene of the abduction would be very minimal, and this was extremely difficult for the detectives to figure out what exactly had happened to Polly. They decided that it would be best to take the rug that was in her room to back to the lab to do, run a DNA analysis on it to figure out if they could find any type of evidence that could lead to a perpetrator or an abductor. So when this happened, the police, they ultimately, um, they notified the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to assist the Petaluma police in the search for Polly. Eventually, the FBI did come to the class family home to get any type of information that they could about what had happened uh, during Polly's disappearance. The FBI quite often handle kidnapping cases, and there are roughly about 800 cases of abductions reported each year to the FBI. A special agent that actually worked for the FBI, his name was Ed Fryer, and he eventually took over the case of Polly. More often than not, most abductions of children are done by a family member, like a custody battle thing if a husband and a wife were to get divorced, or a man and a woman, they have a child together, you know, and they break up. The other parent who does not have custody of the child will try to intervene and kidnap the child. And that's mostly what happens during child abductions. So this case was actually very difficult because Polly's abduction would be classified as a stranger abduction. This realization became a reality after they spoke to Polly's father. And he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect because he was not even in town nor in the same state as Polly whenever her abduction had occurred. When it came to stranger abductions, it's almost impossible to come up with any type of suspects. These type of abductions are extremely rare and can be very difficult to figure out the clues that could lead them to the perpetrator behind the abduction. Luckily, when it came to Polly's abduction, there were actually two witnesses to the crime that were able to help out police as much as they could. These were the two friends that were at the sleepover and they were able to actually provide a description of the abductor to a sketch artist and this was able to be printed out onto flyers and posted around town. So when it comes to stranger abductions, witnesses, re witness reports are extremely important because 
some people aren't able to see exactly when a child gets taken or who takes the child but if there is a witness to the crime it makes it a little bit easier to find the suspect at 4 a.m the following morning the girls were then taken to a police station to provide details of the abductor once they were done the girls returned home and the fbi called in the evidence response team to help search for polly everyone wanted to do what they could to help find her and this was very important in a stranger abduction case because within the 20 first 24 hours of a child abduction case this is most likely when a child would get harmed in any way and it becomes more difficult to figure out what happened so the police always have to act quickly on these types of things so the FBI began searching for fingerprints on Polly's mattress and bed frame to find any evidence of what could have happened, anything that could lead to the perpetrator behind the incident. Only a few hours later, forensic specialists were able to find some very important evidence, and this was said to have actually been a palm print. This palm print was compared to the family and to the girls, and it was said to have not belonged to anyone in that house, not even Polly's father. And it was became very obvious, you know, that this belonged to the abductor himself. This palm print was then collected as evidence to be used to identify the suspect through a fingerprint comparison if possible. The following morning, investigators did a very thorough search of Polly's neighborhood to find any sign of her and her abductor. A hundred investigators had been searching for Polly and her unknown abductor with helicopters used for aerial search which is basically to look above, you know, the ground. Sometimes people can see, you know, people running in fields and it makes it a little bit easier for them to see above ground that would be to be on ground. And there was also bloodhounds that would have been used for the ground search. Police then started to knock on all the homes, all the doors of the homes that were in the surrounding area to ask about Polly's whereabouts. They even traveled to her middle school and asked if anyone, including her friends, had seen Polly or knew anything about this abduction, had any type of evidence that they could provide them, and unfortunately nobody knew anything. The FBI then moves on to ask Polly's neighbors if anyone in the neighborhood had noticed anything suspicious the night that she had been abducted. And then it was at this time when several neighbors claimed to have seen an unrecognized vehicle in the neighborhood. The driver was actually a stranger and this was said to have matched the description of Polly's abductor. A young man, his name was Thomas George, and I think he was maybe around 12 or 13 years old. He had he and his friends, they were going to a local video store that night, and this was around 9 p.m., the same night as Polly's abduction. While walking to the store, he had actually seen a very strange man. He was just lurking in the dark in the shadows, and he was in front of Polly's home. And Thomas, you know, they they kind of lived in a neighborhood where everybody knew everybody. And he had never seen this man before. And it per made him feel extremely anxious and suspicious. He had no idea what this man was doing in his neighborhood. He provides a description of this man to the police. And this description actually matched the description of Polly's abductor. So this was a verified account of a witness, um, a witness account of what the abductor had looked like. There was another man, his name was Sean Bush, who actually lived directly behind the class family home. He was at home playing video games the night that the girl, that um, Polly disappeared. He was with some friends at 10.30 p.m. that night, and he glanced out the window by chance. He just heard some noise and just looked out the window. And this is when he saw a very strange man on the back porch of Polly's family home. This strange man seemed like he was actually trying to find a way into the home and he was trying to break in through the back door. This description of the man also matched the description of Polly's abductor with tons of neighbors actually seeing this guy, but nobody had called the police that night. The lur lurking actually kind of reminded me of the Stephanie Crow case. Remember that guy kind of just like tried to break into all these people's homes and he was kind of a whack job. It kind of reminds me of that. The Petaluma County Police, they began to quickly feel like that the time was actually working against them in this case. When it comes to stranger abductions of children, it's time is very, very critical because 
Any second that she isn't found, she could be harmed. Word had to travel quickly about Polly's abduction to every news outlet that could possibly get pick, like, uh, pick up the case so that they could help search for her and bring in any types of uh, tips that they could about the case. Police continue to search in the Petaluma area for her, and as they do so, they rule out all family members and close friends behind her abduction. After this, police began to search and focus in on registered sex offenders uh, because uh, most sex offenders, they do tend to be attracted to young children. I hate saying it because it's so disgusting, but it's true, and there are sickos out there, and when it comes to sex offenders being attracted to children, it seems more likely than not that they are attracted to young females. Even though the police did their best to search in the area and the surrounding counties, it's quite possible that the man who actually took Polly didn't even live in the state, didn't live in the county. And after all these searches, nothing ended up finding Polly. By the next day, the search of Polly class actually became the largest missing person search in the history of the United States, which is completely mind-blowing to me because, you know, I've covered all these cases where people have had massive searches, and this search in particular just blew that one, all of those out of the water. There was an enormous group of volunteers who decided to help aid in the search for Polly with citizens covering the entire city with flyers with her pictures on them, hoping that someone would recognize her and call the police with any type of tips and information. The same time, the evidence from her home ended up being sent to a forensic lab to find out where she could be or whom could have taken her. The forensic specialist was able to establish that the bindings that the girls had, that had been used to tie the girls up were actually cut from one single cloth. And this, along with the fibers that were found in the home on the carpet, seem to have come from the abductor's vehicle. It's quite possible that he may have just, you know, whenever he broke into the home, he may have just unknowingly tracked them in. Because I don't think anyone, you know, who gets out of a car to go and take someone tries to do that, you know? It, that's what makes sense to me. The palm print was then submitted to a fingerprint anal analysis just to see if the palm print could be matched to anyone in the database and they could figure out who it belonged to. The print was then put under a microscope and it turned the print bright orange, which very frust like it completely frustrated the FBI because this was not what they wanted to happen. They didn't want the palm print to turn orange. It turned orange and they had to go and strip the color from this palm print before they were able to put it into Polly Class's file. 48 hours after Polly's abduction, her father, named Mark, received a very alarming phone call from a young girl. The voice of this young girl was actually said to be, quote, from quoted from Mark himself, that the voice actually sounded exactly like Polly Class herself. She claimed to have been abducted by an unknown creepy man and was being held captive in a hotel room. She said that she was only able to call her father because the abductor had stepped out of the room for just a moment and this gave her enough time to call. And as soon as, you know, she said this, she claimed that she had to hang up and the line ultimately went dead. Two days after... In the two days after her abduction, more than 50,000 flyers were posted around the town of Petaluma, California. 50,000 flyers in two, two days. Like, that is a lot of effort. That is a lot of work. Whenever I found that out, I, my mind was just, like, shocked and blown. I was like, wow, that's incredibly impressive. Local volunteers, they then set up a headquarters for the, for the search to help with the police, and they eventually re ended up receiving 60,000 calls. The volunteers did. Ended up receiving 60,000 calls about tips of where Polly could have been or what could have happened. Out of all of those tips, all 60,000 of them, only one seemed like it was legitimate enough for police to go after and look into it. So 
But before, you know, the investigators could look into it, Mark, he then receives another phone call from this same young girl claiming to be Polly. Unlike the first phone call, the FBI were there this time to be able to listen to it, record it, and be able to trace it eventually. So this voice did sound like Polly and just like last time the girls claimed that she could only talk for a short time and eventually the line went dead. The police were able to trace this phone call and the FBI quickly packed up all of their items and belongings and they made their way towards the location of where the phone call came from. The call actually came from a place that was only 30 minutes away from Polly's home in a suburban area home. So this phone call actually came from a house, which is pretty bizarre. The FBI arrived at the home an hour or so later and they swiftly entered the home, you know, like they broke in, you know, screamed FBI, you know, announced that they were there, and they started sweeping the home for any sign of Polly. And if you don't know what it means to sweep a home, most people, they would have uh, guns or any type of weapons, and they would go and they would uh, make their way into each room, investigate, do what they could, and try to find the perpetrator. So right away, you know, the... FBI were extremely confused because this home did not look like the home of where an abducted child would be and it just seemed like a very typical suburban family home. After a long search of the home they realized that neither Polly nor her abductor were actually there and this had been a prank phone call. The young girl who actually had lived in the home had then admitted to the police that and the FBI that she was the one that made the call. She then explained that a few of her friends from school had dared her to impersonate Polly and call the FBI claiming that she had been in fact kidnapped and held at this hotel. So when the class family they find out about this sick joke, this sick prank, they were obviously just devastated and it broke their heart and their spirits. In the middle of October, just a few weeks after Polly's initial abduction on October 1st, Kate and Jillian provided a different sketch artist of the description of Polly's abductor. Now, this sketch artist was said to have been one of the best sketch artists in the entire, like, country. And this forensic artist was able to create a much more detailed sketch that was ultimately posted around town. This was done in an effort to find Polly and hope that at least one person in the area could identify this person as someone that he or she may have encountered or may know. Pretty soon there was a call to the FBI by someone claiming to be Polly's abductor and that this person would actually release her if he received $10,000 ransom from the FBI. The SWAT team then quickly made their way to the location of this caller and they entered an apartment building where a young teenager was sitting on the couch and watching TV. Once again, this call would prove to be another false alarm because Polly was not even in the apartment. This absolutely devastated the family even more and they ultimately started posting letters and um, just any type of information that they could into the newspapers just begging and pleading for Polly's abductor to return her and let her come home. Nearly two months later, the police actually get their very first promising lead. And this was a call to the police that came from a woman named Dana Jaffe. And she believed that she had some information that could be vital to this case. Dana claimed that she had been, as she had been cleaning her very vast and private property, she noticed something extremely unusual. She then led the investigators to some pretty suspicious items that were found in the woods in her home, by her home. What police ended up finding was a silk cloth that had been used as a hood, pieces of packing tape, and a pair of young girls' tights that had been tied in a knot. Dana then mentioned to police that she had actually had caught a man on her property actually like two months prior in October of her finding all this stuff. 
Her babysitter had left Dana's home that night, and she they she began to drive down Dana's vast driveway, you know, from her private property, going back towards the street, going on home. And this is when Dana's babysitter claimed that she saw a man in her driveway, you know, on the private property. And he told her that he was stranded and needed help with his vehicle. The man then tells the babysitter that he need that she needed to get out of her car and go and help him, for which she refused. So Dana then told police that the man had looked wild and crazy and that she had called police about this man. The man eventually was stopped and pulled over by authorities, the same man that was on the property. He was said to have been extremely sweaty and smelled like alcohol. The authorities had given this man a sobriety test and he ended up somehow passing this test, which if you don't know what sobriety test is, if you get pulled over with uh, by police, they um, would assume that you were drinking and driving, so you would, be, would have been charged with a DUI, and they tried to have you do a sobriety test, which means you walk in a straight line, and you know some people, if they're really drunk, they stumble around, and this would tell you whether or not the person was intoxicated. So he ended up somehow passing this sobriety test, and authorities then started to upset him when they warned him that he could be charged with trespassing on a private property. But unfortunately, they ultimately let this guy go. They didn't know it at this time, but the police had actually just let Polly Class's abductor escape. This had all actually occurred the exact night of Polly's abduction. Just imagine how frustrated those uh, police officers must have felt afterwards, finding out that this was, in fact... Polly's abductor. The deputy who had actually arrived to answer Dana's call eventually made a call to the Petaluma Police Department about what Dana had just told him. Within an hour after the call had been made, a detective and special agent arrived at the scene later that night. Once they arrived, it, be it had begun to storm, you know, just thunderstorms, you know, that's how, it's how crazy weather is, you know, in California. It could be sunny one second, could be dark, and then just boom, you know, thunderstorms. So maybe some intuition, just for some reason, you know, police realized that this area would eventually be the same area that would solve this whole case. The police started a search in the woods behind the family home to look for Polly with over 300 volunteers helping out with the search. And this was done over a time span of three days and unfortunately nothing was ever found from this. The detectives then asked the sheriff to um, make a see the report that Dana had put in and it was then announced that the man on her property was a man named Richard Allen Davis. This man had actually recently been paroled for a sentence for kidnapping, which, I mean, what just happened to Polly? And the photo of Richard that the police actually had on file matched the description of the abductor that had taken Polly. Richard's mother even lived in the Petaluma area, so it's very possible that he may have even been in the area that night. And then it was very obvious that this person was, in fact, Polly's abductor. The cloth that had been found on Dana's property was then brought back to a forensic lab for testing and the DNA actually matched Richard Allen Davis's DNA that had been on file from his um, kidnapping charge that he had. All of these pieces of cloth that had actually been found were cut from the same larger piece of cloth and ultimately were used for bindings during the original kidnapping scenario. So the detectives, they had theorized that if they could get Richard just into custody, then the case might truly be solved. Police then look up Richard Allen Davis in their database to figure out what type of information they could find on him, and they actually find out that he has an outstanding warrant for his arrest. Which basically, if you don't know what that means, it means that police put out this warrant or this search that you know, if, God forbid, you know, police run into this guy, they have to arrest him on the spot because he needed to, um, he had done some type of a crime that was considered very dangerous and could put him in jail. 
So this actually meant that if he could be connected to Polly's abduction in any way, shape, or form, he could be charged with her abduction as well as with the whole outstanding warrant. So they travel to his home and while doing a very extensive search of Richard Allen Davis's property, they realized that he was not in fact home at all. There was a deputy at the beginning of the road who ended up stopping a van for speeding. When he pulled the van over and asked to read this man's ID, he realized that it said Richard Allen Davis. Boom, this was the guy that they had been looking for. The deputy then calls it into investigators like, ring, 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 hello, you know, I just found, you know, Richard Allen Davis and just pulled him over, he's over here. So they, he asked Richard to step out of his vehicle and he was then ultimately arrested for violating his parole, which if you don't know, is a huge no-no in forensics and stuff. You don't ever violate your parole. You'll end up in jail. After two months since last seeing him, Jillian and Kate were brought into the, um, the, t the police station to identify this man, Richard Allen Davis, as possibly being Polly's kidnapper. And both Jillian and Kate were able to correctly identify him as the one that had broken into Polly's house that night and took her. So... Police, they then take him into a room and they begin to question him about Polly's kidnapping for which he in vehemently like denied any type of involvement in Polly's disappearance. At the forensic lab, a man he then compares the palm print found on the palms at the crime scene to Richard's palm print and this revealed to have been a perfect match. This ultimately thrilled every investigator working on this case because they knew they found this guy. They have this guy. He is here. They've got him. So Richard actually had no, absolutely no idea about the police matching his palm print to the palm print that had been found on uh, the poly, in Polly class's room. And this, you know, shocked him whenever he found out. So the... A friend of his actually came into his holding cell and told him that he had seen on TV that Richard's palm print was matched with the one that was in Polly Class's room. And this friend urged Richard to come clean and tell authorities what he did to Polly and that he was the one involved. Which Richard, he just continuously denied it. He then accused police of planting the... Um, his palm print there and planting his DNA there as a reason as like an effort to attack him and to target him for this kidnapping that he quote unquote had no involvement in. So once authorities tell him about all of this, he realizes, you know, oh my God, you know, I'm screwed at this point. So this is when he decides to make a deal with authorities. Detective Meese, who was the lead detective on Polly's Polly's case, he calls Richard the following day as he is being held in a jail cell. He had done this in order to try to get any type of information he out of Richard as to where Polly could be. You know, he tried to relax Richard, make him feel comfortable, and basically break him down in a way that he would feel like he can confess to this investigator that he would not you know, be treated any differently, would not be targeted for this. He wouldn't be told, you know, you're a piece of crap for kidnapping this girl. You know, he just felt very relaxed and at ease talking to this guy. So he ends up telling the detective, Detective Meese, I screwed up big time. The detective then tells Richard that he will meet up with him later to discuss what he needs to say and to get something off of his chest. And Detective Meese does keep his word. For the following day, he does show up to the jail to go and speak with Richard. He begins to tell the police exactly what had happened the night of October 1st, 1993 at Polly Class's home. He had been attempting to travel to his mother's house, but he could not find it. I'm not sure if maybe it was just too dark. He wasn't 100% sure of the directions. Maybe he was on the wrong street. 
he just was very confused and it was at this point that he decided to travel and go out and buy a pack of beers before drinking some and arriving in Polly's neighborhood just by random. In the back seat of his car, Richard had actually brought a bag and this bag was packed with bindings and tape because he knew that he wanted to abduct someone. So the fact that he said that he was going to his mother's home and got lost, it kind of doesn't line up with how he said that he was going to abduct someone. So it just kind of makes no sense to authorities at this point, but they're just letting Richard just explain himself. He took the cloth that he had in his car and he began to cut it into strips with scissors before crawling into an opened window in Polly's house. He then, you know, went in there, you know, threatened the girls with the knife and he abducted Polly by knife point and took her into his car driving out of the neighborhood. Richard said it was at this point that he felt like he just woke up out of a trance and he realized that Polly was in his car. I'm not all saying that he was in a trance, that he was in a trance. I don't know. He could have been in a drunken stupor, had no idea what was going on. You know, he could have some mental issues that we are just not aware of. But this is 100% of what was said to have happened, according to Richard. And he just realized, like, oh my god, you know, there's this girl in my car. What am I going to do? I don't remember taking her. She started complaining to Richard that her hands were hurting because he had tied the bindings around her wrists too tight. And it just felt like she was losing blood circulation. She started begging for him to let her go, but he only adjusted the straps. Still unsure of why he had taken Polly. He had no idea what it was what had happened. No idea why he kidnapped this girl. No idea like why he broke into this house. Didn't even remember breaking into the house. Didn't remember even being in that neighborhood. In fact, he actually told police that he actually didn't even know he kidnapped her until he looked over and noticed that she was in his car. And this kind of freaked him out a little bit. Richard then drove into the woods behind Dana's home before he managed to get his vehicle stuck in the mud. Realizing he couldn't move any further, he took Polly out and carried her out of his car before hiding her somewhere in the woods. And it was in this location that he would end up being, you know, found by police officers who eventually helped him, you know, move his car out of the way. So it was not, like the police, they didn't even know at this point that Polly had been abducted. So they just kind of helped him on his way to get out of the area that he was in. So only 30 minutes later, he continues to drive around the area when he realizes that Polly knows too much about him, knows too much about the whole abduction scenario, and he realizes very quickly that he needed to take, like get rid of her once and for all and Richard he then took authorities to the site of Polly's burial and this was located in Cloverdale California not far from where Petaluma was he leads them into a field in the town that had been an area that had been previously used as a lumber mill but had been closed down years prior possibly the 60s or the 70s and this exact field, covered up by a wooden board, was in fact the deceased body of 12-year-old Polly Hannah Class. In 1996, just three years later, the case ended up going to trial and the jury ultimately found Richard Allen Davis guilty of the first degree murder of Polly Hannah Class. Authorities believed that at the time that he was pulled over that Polly had actually already been deceased. He was ultimately sentenced to death at San Quentin Prison in San Quentin, California. And as of April 2022, it is said that he is still in that prison awaiting his execution. After her murder, there was ultimately a foundation that was created in her honor called the Polly Class Foundation. This foundation provides information about stranger abduction and pro and helps provi uh, provide kits for parents to teach children about abduction safety. 
and how to protect your children from child predators. Because like I've said before, there are children out there who want to take your kid. Not children out there. There are people out there who want to take your kids. And this can be a very scary thought, especially if you don't preach stranger danger to your children. You know, even if you feel like you live in a safe area, not every single area is safe. And it's very important to tell your children that even if someone seems like a very trusting adult, there's sometimes, you know, they're... They aren't trusting adults. So since its foundation began in 1993, the foundation has helped more than 10,000 children actually come home to their families, which is incredibly impressive. There is a website actually called polyclass.org, and I will link that down below where you can provide a donation to help bring home missing children. The donations help families and children safe, stay safe from predators along with personally assisting the to help the families of missing children. And I, like I said, I'm going to link the website down below in the description box. So please donate what you can and donate when you can because every little bit helps. And it will help bring home these children that have gone missing and have been taken by predators. As always, please let me know what your thoughts and opinions are down below in the comments section. I would love to know what you think about this. And don't forget to donate down below in the, in the link that I provide in the description box. It will seriously help so many families out there. You have no idea. And don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Hit the little bell notification so that you never miss any of my videos. Like I said before, I post on Tuesdays and Fridays with my more recent cases on Tuesdays and my vintage cases on Fridays. Occasionally I will post some stuff that occurs in the news with celebrities as well. Just any type of drama filled entertainment. And please, like I said, keep her family's thought, names, thoughts in your prayers and just, you know, help out this family as best you can by donating to this foundation help other families out there with missing children help them bring them home and like I said before um, this foundation has even helped with I believe it was Jacob Wetterling help that case get solved and you know I've mentioned a lot of other foundations as well so there's the Polly Class Foundation the Morgan Nick Foundation the Jacob Wetterling Foundation um, I believe there's a couple of other places you can help. There's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You can help donate for that as well. And I will provide as many links as I can down below in the description box. And please let me know what you guys think about this case. This is a pretty wild one. The fact that it took so long for this case to get solved. So many people wanted her to get brought back to um, her family safely. And it just didn't happen because this sick guy broke into their home and kidnapped this poor little 12 year old girl and murdered her for no reason whatsoever other than the fact that he didn't know what the hell he was doing apparently apparently and like i said i would love to know what you guys think about that do you think that he was zoinked out of his mind on drugs do you think he knew what he was doing when he took polly do you think he knew what he was doing when he killed her do you think he just made this all up to make him uh, seem crazy and try to take an insanity plea what do you guys think about this case and don't forget to let me know any other cases you would like me to cover down below in the comment section. And for now, I'm going to sign off and I'll be seeing you guys in my next video on Friday. Bye guys!